Kia ora guys, welcome back to the Black Jersey. My name's Max and I'm the host of this channel. A big thank you will always go to my awesome patrons for supporting me. I'm also just going to give a reminder as per usual to my new viewers. Um, if you like my content, just remember to subscribe to my channel and like this video and comment on this video if you enjoy it. Of course, we need to get the subscriber percentage up a wee little bit as you can see. So Scotland have beaten England by 29 to 20. 23 and um, before I go off on a holiday for a couple of days I just wanted to give my thoughts on this match that I watched and my goodness it was a real Jekyll and Hyde performance for England whereas going into the game I was also quite nervous for the Scots um, Darcy Graham is injured whereas they chose to start Ben White over Ali Price who I thought would be a very important player for the Six Nations. In my previous video about the Scotland squad I also said that they would need to win the the Six Nations to be a threat at the World Cup as they are indeed in the pool of death with Ireland and South Africa so it's going to be very very hard for them. I'm going to break down my thoughts on this game by looking at all the tries that were scored, doing a bit of a contrast for some half time and full time stats as well as just some other bits and bobs that I think are relevant to the match. Let's get right into this. I'm not going to start this analysis of the video chronologically just for the purposes of comparing each team's kicking game. We start off ahead of England's first try in the 24th minute. 55% of England's rucks in the first half lasted less than two seconds. The greatest ruck speed of all time somehow remains with this team even after Eddie Jones, their greatest ever coach, has left. As we can see, this ruck speed has led to battered bodies piled all over the pitch about five metres from the Scottish try line. As Jack Van Portvliet exits the ruck with the ball, we do need to pay some attention to his reactionary body language. He's looking back to Marcus Smith while he has a three-man pot of Ben Curry, Maru Atoja and Lewis Ludlam to the inside. Smith's pointing for the ball and is clearly directing the pod to get some go forward with Ludlam going to ground after taking the pass off Curry's shoulder. As we move over a few more frames, Sinclair and Smith are clearly pointing for the ball with Kyle Sinclair running two metres in a pod with George before going out the back to Smith. The shape of the England backs is then foreshadowed to us ahead of the wide shot with Joe Marchant already coming up towards the Scotland's defence at pace. As we finally reach this wide shot, we see that Scotland's entire team is packed into just one side of the pitch with just two players including man of the match Duhan van der Merwe to the left of the goalposts. Mark Marcus Smith has done an excellent job with his game management as per usual with his kick going over to an unmarked Max Malins who was able to score England's opening try thanks to Smith's utter deconstruction of a huge hole in the Scottish defence line. But now we get to something that I really have to talk about with the Scots in the attacking game. Um, the reason I haven't done this analysis chronologically is because we need to look at how much more organised the Scotland attack is, even with Brad Moore of all people as their new attack coach. While the first England's try was very well worked, it was all just a case of playing to what Marcus Smith was able to spot with his vision. Compare this to Scotland, who have done this perfectly, mastering a pre-planned strategy ahead of the World Cup, where cutting back to the 15th minute of the match as Ben White goes out the back in a rare start. Veer Pianel is superbly guarding the fringe of the ruck so that Alex Dombrand has no access to the ball with Turner binding onto the England players. They needed to do this as Dombrand did get a few turnovers through the match. With clean wall for Ben White, Scotland are able to perform a well-rehearsed training move to perfection. The clue of what's going on is in the body language of Stuart Hogg who runs across to the open side of the pitch as Jamie George clearly watches him. As a member of the England spine, Jamie George is a key decision maker for the team and calls for some man marking out wide. In the first frame of the wide shot, Richie Gray is in first receiver while five of his teammates are to the right of him. While Matt Fagerson's dummy line is utterly pointless, it detaches Jamie George, a key decision maker from the rest of his defence, who now need to rely on instincts. While England do have the numbers out wide, it's not really quite clear who's marking who in the middle of the pitch, hence why Scotland have opted to go towards the route they're on. 
While Finn Russell is incredibly flat, Lajlam heads toward him like a spy drone to America due to his reputation as an unpredictable player until, however, Russell begins moving sideways with Duhan van der Merwe following suit. Smith looks to kill the ball at source by shooting up, but with the absence of him and Ludlam, this leaves a huge hole in the backfield. Scotland's backs have intentionally tilted their shoulders out to the open side to bait England into attempting to shut down a wide running attack. That just isn't happening though. Sione Tuipilotu initially looks like he's a terrible distributor lacking any flow, but he's not there for the purpose of distribution through to Van der Merwe. He's there to grubber through for his Glasgow club teammate, Hugh Jones. Though I would have preferred Cam Redpath at number 12 for the sake of getting a balanced midfielder with a kicking game and a massive defensive game in with Hugh Jones, an amazing strike runner, everything has worked very well and selecting Jones with Tui Pilotu was a masterstroke. Because they play together at club level at Glasgow, it was a really important call for the sake of creativity, especially considering how awful Finn Russell is at managing a game plan. Now we have to get to an absolute one to try, one of the greatest tries of all time, Duhan van der Merwe got an absolute stunner in the first half. I don't really like to ruin all time great tries with over analysing them, so we're just trying to get this one here over and done with. Okay guys, let's get to it. Scotland's team has inherited another perk of playing together for a long time, as Jamie Ritchie and Grant Gilchrist do a brilliant job at creating a gap to open up the pitch for a breakaway try with a kicking war now over. With Ritchie and Gilchrist both marked by two England's defenders, who is marking Duhan van der Merwe? Not only was this a great job at stopping Marchin and Farrell from marking van der Merwe, but this also opened opportunities out in the back. George and Dombrand, who are both forwards, have to run sideways. This allows for van der Merwe to beat another two defenders, so great work by Richie and Gilchrist. The rest is pretty much all history. He is able to score this try thanks to pure talent. Um, I won't go over Max Malins' second try too much either. Um, it was pretty much much just a fluke now that we can see it that was created by an attacking overlap for England. Hogg as we can see is on his own in the backfield. It's a simple two on one, even Clive Woodward himself could come out of retirement and score this one if only he came out of coaching retirement so we could lose his arrogance. Now what we need to discuss is the half time stats. Though England were up by 48% for possession, Scotland were only losing by a single point. This is especially crazy when we can see England, according to Ultimate Rugby, my source for stats, had 66% territory. England had nearly doubled Scotland for metres run, as we can see. Um, they'd won three turnovers to the Scotland, one turnover, made more than twice as many passes, more than twice as many gain line carries. But England's tackle percentage was not looking good. Just 82%, 47 from 57, while Scotland, after over 100 tackles, was still on 93%. Goal success pretty bad for both teams. Ruck success though quite similarly. Um, they were both at 97%. Um, they'd obviously um, had more rucks of their own, the English team, whereas Scotland had way fewer. Um, but seeing them at the same, I think, kind of reflects the margin of the game that we're seeing right now at half time. Um, scrum success for Scotland, pretty dire. Um, I guess that's just a perk of um, England having Alice Genge and Kyle Sinclair in their team. While um, there weren't too many penalties for either side either so that's very good to see. Now that we're into the second half it takes a wee while for more points to be added to the scoreboard um, for Scotland though Alice Genge does get a very nice close range effort for England. Dang dude I have got a lot to say about Scotland's response just two minutes after Genge scored. We have to get into this. Scotland are doing what any tier one nation is expected to do. They're doing a brilliant job at recycling the ball. They're sensibly doing it in the 51st minute until all of a sudden their lack of attacking opportunities end. Ben Curry, despite looking like a 40 test veteran in British and Irish Lion, is on just his second test cap. As most decent forwards know, you need to have a strong boxer's stance when heading into a tackle. Curry, however, has just a single foot planted while it's off to the side. Ideally, your dominant shoulder has a foot directly underneath it when you make a tackle. Ben Curry, however, has got far too excited and he pays for it big time. By not following through with his leg, like you should in a tackle, Curry has completely given up his body position 
opening the field for Ben White. Stewart, having been forced to run across from the other side of the pitch, was never going to be able to hit a target so much smaller as White capitalises perfectly off an awful mistake made by Curry. Although a lot of the critics are trying to scapegoat Alex Dombrand, um, I think Ben Curry will definitely have to improve from 13 out of 17 tackles ahead of his third test cap. As you can see, guys, there were a lot of players, according to ESPN, with a far lower tackle ratio than Ben Curry. Um, I'd have preferred to see Ben Curry subbed off as tackles he missed counted for more. I also think Scotland were quite smart to go for a penalty late in the game as well as they still had enough time to get a few more points on the board. As England were up by this margin, I think it made sense by getting a try after this penalty, they would essentially be able to put the game out of reach for England. I don't like the way Russell was managing things poorly with things such as that really bad crossfield kick for the sake of it, but it's okay. Duhan van der Merwe comes through for Scotland with a last minute try. Um, I've also seen... Goodness me, I've seen Steve Borthwick trying to blame the state of the squad on what he's inherited from Eddie Jones. After speaking like that from just one test match, I don't think that bodes very well for your side at all. The um, final score was 29 to 23, and though England had 71% territory and 57% possession, Scotland were able to make the most of what they got. England, despite having the world's quickest ruck speed, could not get anything out of it. As we can see, look at all these stats that England's dominated for attack. It's completely ridiculous that they couldn't generate much off it. Goal kicking success. Um, though Owen Farrell's goal kicking did, didn't did cost them the game, rather, um, I do think Farrell is still looking a bit rusty um, after all that time he missed due to injury over the 2021-22 season. Um, Scotland's ruck success, though. After the entire match, they had a better ruck success than England. It's not necessarily the speed of the rucks that count the most, but it's the ability to win them that counts the most. It's very good to have them as quick as possible, but you do have to um, look at winning as much of them as possible. Line act success though, beautiful stuff Scotland at 100% for the lineouts. Um, I don't think the mu there's, there's much rather to commentate on this with the scrum though. Um, England got two from two, Scotland five from seven. So England's scrum percentage, I don't think we can take much away from that. And penalties given away. England's conceded 10, Scotland conceded nine. So if it weren't for that one penalty they gave away, Scotland would have won by only a few more points. Well, I've said a lot of stuff about what the state of England is right now. Um, I'm very happy with what Scotland did. Hopefully their days of being brave losers are over and hopefully their days of having a beautiful forward pack are just beginning. Um, I want to say thanks to my patrons one more time. I want to thank you guys all for watching this video. Um, that's going to be it from me today. Thank you very much, guys, and I'll see you later. Cheers from Max.